the show starts in three, two, one, go. What is going on, Kane Sport? It is Azubi Charles, and good morning to you all. It is February 28th, 2023, and I would like to thank everyone for joining us on Good Morning Kane Sport. Today, I'm joined by Matt Chadell and Steven Wagner as we break down the news of the day and still try to find out if Gary's at Hooters or not. So we'll probably have an update, hopefully, with that sometime during this week. First off, On3 released some new rankings for the 2024 class, and Steven has been working tirelessly going through it, figuring out where the Miami targets are. Steven, I'll throw it to you. From the new rankings, what have you seen, and just what are your overall impressions of it? Yeah, so the new rankings really did kind of, you know, throw a wrench in everything. Um, you know, everything that we thought we knew – uh, beforehand, you know, throw that out the window. I'm totally kidding. Definitely don't do that. Uh, but there have been uh, a few. Good work, Steven. Whoa, 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 whoa. What is going on here, guys? Okay, I, I, I get locked up for a few days and all hell breaks loose. Azubi, it's not what's up, Kane Sport. It's, it's February the 20th. It's Good morning, King Sport. It's February 28th, 2023, and you go on from there. You you get you got to bring some energy to this thing. Matt, how you been, buddy? Steve. Hey, I am going to I am going to need a detailed a, a detailed description of your whereabouts on January 6th because <laughs> you seem to be very comfortable staging all sorts of coups. <laughs> so what's up, guys? How's it been going here? Wait, we gotta we gotta rearrange the script. I can't. This is throwing me off. Give me a minute. All right, Stephen, you keep being confused. Um, Azubi, you're gonna be by yourself in a minute. Azubi, you gotta move over. Matt, you're on the wrong side. All right, Matt, you're back. Azubi, you're back. Stephen, I hope you're not confused anymore. All right, let's go. Let's take this baby from the top. You guys ready? Yes. Oof. Let's do it. <laughs> Go for where, it. where were you, Foreman? Where were you the last? No comment. No comment. Wow. Okay, let's just move on from that last week. And just he wow. took a pill in Ibiza and fell off the face of the earth. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go. Let's let, 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 let's 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 try this the right way. Three, two, one. Good morning, Kane Sport. It's February twenty eighth, twenty twenty three. I'm Gary Furman, still the publisher of KaneSport.com. Joined by the whole crew this morning, Azubi Charles, my, uh, what should we call Azubi, Matt? My, my, uh -huh. my understudy? <laughs> I'd say, you're, I'd say you're, you're better replacement is what I call him. All right. My better replacement, Azubi Charles, <laughs> Matt Shodell, our managing editor, and Stephen Wagner, who's always confused as we discuss <laughs> the news of the day. Not presented by Life Wallet right now, so I'm not going to say that part. Um... Was coming. All right, so let's jump right into it. All right, as um, as we were talking about, on three released a new ranking structure uh, for what used to be the composite rankings, and I like it a lot. Stephen, why don't you explain it, and um, and then we'll we'll discuss it as a group a little bit together. Yeah. So remember the on three consensus? Well, that doesn't exist anymore. Rest in peace to the on three consensus. You know, put. Put, put up a gravestone and you can write on the epitaph on three consensus from whenever to whenever because I don't know when it started, but uh, it ended on February 27th. And uh, it's being replaced by the on three industry ranking. And the key difference here is the on three consensus was equally weighted uh, between on three rivals, 247 Sports and ESPN, the four major recruiting sites, the industry ranking is not. What it does is it weighs on three and 247 evenly. Uh, they both, they're both weighted at 35%. Uh, then it weighs rivals at, I think, 25%. And then ESPN comes in uh, weighed at 10%. And Shannon Terry, uh, our Lord and Savior, uh, the, uh, the, wise man who controls all three all things on three uh he kind of broke this down a little bit in a in a tweet that he had on monday where he said kind of the reason for uh you know weighing it this way was looking at the amount of uh investment that each of these sites really has you know in recruiting and in rankings uh and in recruiting coverage more generally and obviously 
on three as a company that invests very heavily uh, in recruiting and trying to get these rankings right and its scouting department, all that good stuff. I mean, heck, that's, you know, that's why I'm here. That's how I have a job. Uh, and 247 also is a company that invests uh, obviously heavily in that. Uh, and so us and 247 are weighed the heaviest. After that, we've got rivals. And then after that, we've got ESPN. So whenever you go uh, to where the on three consensus rankings used to be, now you're going to see the on three industry rankings instead. And what that's done is it's gone ahead and it's mixed up a couple of uh, a couple of the recruit rankings uh, a little bit. We saw a few recruits trend up. We saw a few recruits trend down. Uh, but more generally, slight adjustment. Um, don't think it's going to you know be the end of the world, but we do think that this is going to be something that's uh, going to be able to to provide a much more accurate picture into how these recruits uh, actually stack up. You know, rankings are funny because everybody kind of wants to be the authority in rankings. Uh, uh, I don't know if you guys have been following the professional golf uh, brouhaha that's been going on in the last year. Uh, and with the official world golf rankings, not acknowledging players that are playing for the live golf tour and stuff like that. So um, sports illustrated created their own, world golf ranking and they're trying to blow out the current existing official world golf ranking by saying well we've got the real official world golf ranking because we include uh the live players and uh so here now that brings us to this and we got to tread carefully guys because until july we are contractually prohibited really from discussing rivals so um i'm gonna throw that out there so nobody slips i don't want to get sued um <laughs> no seriously i'm serious about this uh we can't really talk much about rivals but i like what on three has done here because I, I agree that the greatest investment in scouting uh in trying to get these rankings right are is done by 24 7 and on three and uh i think that to have a composite ranking that adequately shows that is a plus for the entire industry. It's a plus for the coaches, the players, the high school coaches, uh, and pretty much everybody, the fans too, like, who pay attention to these rankings and really like to dive into them deep and, and use them as a barometer for how their team is doing in recruiting. Uh, so plus, 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 I think uh, all across the board uh, on this new composite rankings algorithm uh, that has been created by on three and um, Azubi, you played high school football. Uh, I'm sure you, you know, you paid attention. What, what was your star ranking when you were in high school? Did you make it? Uh, I was a six star recruit before, you know, my, my, my knee injuries came in and I chose the journalism route, but no rankings are always something, you know, kids are, Oh, I'm a three star. I'm a four star. Or, oh, I'm a, you know, not too many five stars coming out of Fort Myers, but we've had a few back in the day, but rankings was always something, you know, us kids, I say us kids, like I'm not an old man, but we, we always paid attention to, you know, back in the day, oh, what's your rivals, oh, what's your 24-7, what's your on three, all that good stuff. So it's cool seeing it. I know everybody's not going to be happy, you know, unless you're number one in the country and every site, you're not going to be happy. But I feel like this is a great, you know, representation of, like you said, actually, you know, putting everyone in a way to consideration with 247 and on three having the higher percentage compared to everybody else. So I really like this new system. Just got to get used to not calling it the on three, on three consensus anymore. <laughs> uh, Matt, you, you're chomping at the bit up there. I can tell you're getting impatient. Uh, you were gasping a minute ago. So I'm going to change the subject because I think that we've pretty much uh, covered this rankings transformation taking place in the industry, uh, a transformational new approach to, to rankings. And um, I want to shift gears to the ongoing uh, coaching searches taking place for a defensive ends coach, which we know Jason Taylor's at the top of the wish list there. I think that one's gonna be an issue of can Mario Cristobal get Jason Taylor to take the job as defensive ends coach? Uh, and the wide receiver coaching position that's still open as we sit here uh, six days, no, what, five days now before the start of spring practice. and. Uh, I know you're more concerned about this than I am, so I'm gonna let you talk a little bit about it. Uh, is it taking too long to get this whole staff pulled together or do they have plenty of analysts, GAs, et cetera, et cetera? Like, can't David Cooney take the receivers for a week or so if he needs to, um, for example, or, you know, 
can't uh, Jason Taylor, as an analyst, if he doesn't want to be a full-time coach, take charge of the defensive ends the first week of spring practice? It, is this something to be concerned about, in your opinion? Well, as usual, you're wrong, because I do want to talk about the rankings. I didn't say anything. <laughs> well, you're wrong, because you said I can't talk about the rankings. I want to talk about the rankings. All right, well, and, I'm sorry. And, and then I'll talk about the other stuff. Well, I'm just trying to, like, slide back here on eggshells, to be honest with you, because... Well, you know, Azubi is a rock star, and he very quickly built a very strong following out there uh, in the cyber universe. Uh, Steven, if he would just shave his mustache, would be making a lot of people out there very, very happy. I mean, there's not a day that goes by on the YouTube comments where they don't, I don't know if they're men or women, Steven, but they're saying Steven has to, ch has to shave his mustache. So, you know, but so I'm just like trying to like blend into the background here. So, you know, go ahead, Matt, take it. I mean, you always do so well at blending into the background, Gary. Uh, okay, so so the rankings, it, it's just funny to me how they have this huge explanation, an actual story on how they've come up with the greatest, most accurate ranking system ever. You know, I'm sure it was like a month long retreat for all of the analysts. Um, you know, where they had to figure out the system that's supposed to lift, lift the veil to have these accurate rankings. Uh, but, but, you know, the, the, the truth is that, um, you know, not, not just on three, but even the people that might sue Gary, uh, some people probably hope they sue Gary, uh, you know, nobody knows who really does these rankings or how, they're, how they come up with these numbers, like at any of these networks. It, it, this, you're a five-star, you get this rating, whatever, whatever. There's no explanation of these four guys really liked you and this, these two guys hated him. But we came to a consensus here, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, at this point, I can only assume the guys that are five stars are the ones that are doing the rankings because that's the only thing that makes any sense to me out of this whole nonsense mumbo jumbo of what rankings have become. They didn't ask me. They didn't bring me on the month-long retreat. If they had asked me, I would have told them it's very simple. What fans want to see is what I want to see when I'm doing fantasy football. When I'm doing fantasy football, the day before lineups are due, I type in fantasy football Yahoo Sports. And they have every single expert, like 15 of them. And under those 15 experts, they have a list for each of them, how they're ranking every player in a blind study. They're not asking four other people, five other people, hey, what do you think of this guy's film? Because if I ask 10 people what they think of a restaurant and they say how amazing it is, I'm going to be inclined to say it's amazing because I'm as weak-minded as the next person. So I like when people can make their own individual determination that, hey, this kid sucks or, hey, this kid's great. And then we can see who says what about each kid and rank them that way. So I would love to see, um, you know, sort of sort of see who ranks who where, because guess what? If you have a guy who's based in Alabama and all of his rankings have South, you know, Southeast guys or, or you know, or Alabama guys, just high, you know, SEC guys being recruited, just higher up than South Florida guys or guys that might go out West, that says something to me. And we don't know. And I'm not talking about on three guys. I'm talking about across the country all these different networks have different guys in all different areas of the country. I'd love to see if the guys who cover recruiting out West have a bigger say and are ranking guys higher that are out West because they haven't seen the guys in person out East. They're just looking at highlight tape. I would love to have individual analyst rankings, just like the Yahoo, for people who do fantasy football, just like the Yahoo sports where you have one guy and he's ranking the top 20 running backs, the top 20 wide receivers, the top 20, whatever's it's not that hard to do, but they didn't ask me. They didn't bring me on the retreat. All right, I don't want to talk about it too long. Um, anyway, coaching search. Uh, yeah, Jason Taylor would be a great hire. Obviously, Leonard Hankerson would have been a home run. It's disappointing that that didn't work out. Uh, you said there's five days left until the first day of spring practice. Uh, there's four because I can count and you cannot. Today is uh, Tuesday. So, um, you know, to not have a wide receivers coach uh, to start spring practice is, is, a, is a real possibility because even if Mario announces somebody today, he has to jump through all sorts of hoops. Um, you know, just like what Gary was doing at Hooters. That's what people said you were doing, Gary, jumping through hoops at Hooters. Uh, you, have to jump, you, have to, you have to fill out paperwork, be cleared. You know, compliance has to get you okayed to, to be recruiting even. You know, and, and March 4th, there's going to be recruits all over the place. You can't have a guy not cleared to recruit and recruits trying to talk to him and he's like, get away from me. Like, that doesn't work, you know? Uh, so there's a bunch of issues. My only problem, I, I, I don't mind Mario taking his time and as Gary says, these guys come in and Mario picks their brain and has these fantastic ideas about how he could throw the ball down the field, even though we all know he just wants to run right up the middle every time. Uh, that's great. But I want coach. I want a coaching staff in place for spring practice. I don't want to be the only major college program that I can think of 
that doesn't have a position coach where the wide receivers is, you know, is Mark Pope going to be back to help the wide receivers know what to do? I don't know. Like, it's just some former player going to show up and be like, hey, I'm volunteering today. Like, you know, flavor of the month. I don't know. Like, that's not for me, bro. I just want like a real coach who like can start coaching the guys how he wants to and work with the other coaches and not have these 15 practices be a waste for these wide receivers. I mean, they'll get something out of it, but maybe not everything they should. Well, um, look, I've, I'm not as panicked about it, but I, I don't agree. I just, it's not ideal. I agree. But, you know, here, here's the thing. And Steven's got a really good story on the site today uh, with film breakdown of Ryan Wingo. He's one of the top receivers in the country. We know all about Jeremiah Smith, besides a trader here in South Florida. Uh, to me, the most important thing for this program, and it's critical, is whoever the wide receiver coach is that comes through the door here in the near future, that guy needs to be able to win. Okay, like, they got to start winning these battles to continue to build on what Mario's trying to build. So to me, way more important that they get the right wide receivers coach than how quickly they find that guy. Now that said, the search has been going on for a while. Um, Mario most more than likely has worked his way through the pool. Um, we know that Kevin Beard got an interview. Uh, we know that, Lamar Thomas was at least in the discussion. Now, whether he ends up getting an offer or not remains to be seen. Uh, and I'm sure there are a few other guys uh, that have been in the mix as well. Uh, I know one more. It would be reckless for me to throw his name out here right now. He's employed by another school. And I understand how Mario likes this process to be. And I'm not looking to destroy that process. But uh i don't I, I just think it's a lot more significant that he get the right guy that's a good wide receivers coach but more than anything can go toe to toe with alabama georgia and ohio state and win on these elite prospects steven uh you broke down ryan wingo today uh stories on the website for everybody to see uh tell us a what you think about what i was just uh saying about the wide receiver coach and and how important the recruiting aspect of that job will be. And then tell us what you think of Ryan Wingo. Yeah, I really think you hit the nail on the head. Uh, I thought- Of course I did, that's why I'm back. <laughs> Obviously, Hankerson would have really been that home run hire. You're talking about a guy uh, you know, coming straight out of the NFL and you know, a, a, guy, a guy who was coaching Debo Samuel and Brandon Ayuk. Uh, up in San Francisco, or I, I guess in this case, you know, is uh, coaching Brandon Ayuk and Debo Samuel up in San Francisco. Uh, you've got a guy with tremendous experience as a player. You've got a guy with tremendous experience as a coach. You've got a guy with tremendous ties and recruiting connections to the area, to South Florida, who, you know, really knows South Florida talent and these South Florida high schools that Miami, quite frankly, needs to win every single year. He knows them like the back of his hand. Uh, and it really is unfortunate that they didn't work out because whenever I think about how is Miami going to win guys like Brandon Ennis and Jeremiah Smith from Ohio State, what those guys always tell me is, well, it comes down to, you know, it, it comes down to development. And what guy can I trust more than Brian Hartline? And now that Brian Hartline has been promoted to Ohio State's offensive coordinator, and he's going to have an even more involved role uh, in recruitment and in the Ohio State offense, now Brian Hartline can go out and he can pitch to these receivers, you know, like, hey, I won't just turn you into a great receiver. I can also throw you the ball as much as I want to, too, because I'm calling the plays now and we can zip that thing around the field however much we want. Uh, and so if Miami's going to beat that, they need to have a guy that these guys like Jeremiah Smith and Brandon Ennis, and I know that Brandon Ennis isn't a 2024 kid. He was 2023, but Miami needs someone who these guys can trust. Yeah. This is a guy who has worked with these elite level talents. He's a guy who's going to turn me into this first round draft pick. He's a guy who can make me Chris Olave and Marvin Harrison. And, you know, Miami receivers aren't just going to be compared to, you know, well, who's going to be the next Braxton Berrios? No respect to Braxton. He was a tremendous player and really fun to watch. 
but I mean, I mean, come on, you know, th this is this is a school where Michael Irvin went. Yeah, you know, but like that should, you know, that's the standard. You know, Miami used to turn out receivers like it was nothing. You know, Andre Johnson and Michael Irvin and all of these, you know, tremendous first round picks and future Hall of Famers and all of this stuff. And Miami strayed away from that in recent years. But kind of turning to Ryan Wingo, because I got off on a little bit of a tangent there. Uh, Ryan Wingo is a really, he's a really fun and creative kind of do it all player. Uh, you see the stuff that Ryan Wingo was able to do last year uh, in St. Louis. And he's a guy, you know, you can line him up as a Wildcat quarterback. You can put him in the backfield. Uh, heck, you can put him at defensive back and safety. Uh, you can you can put him in the slot. You can line him out wide. Um, he really was the offense for his team last year, and he is tremendously talented. Uh, he's a kid who's picking up a lot of offers and a lot of interest. Miami's remaining high on him. The Canes are continuing to pursue him uh, as much as they can. Uh, and he's got his eye on Shannon Dawson as well. Hey, Matt, who's the guy on the YouTube comments that keeps telling, saying that Steven talks too long? Who's that guy? <laughs> um, it's Matt's burner account. That's what yeah, great. It's Matt's great. burner account. <laughs> if Gary's going to let me talk, I'm going to say my piece, damn it. <laughs> Hey man, like I said, I'm just trying to blend into the background here, you know, uh, not not rattle too many uh, too many cages. Uh, all right, so so anyway, so the wide receiver coaching search continues. Uh, depending on your viewpoint, it's a panic situation or not, and uh, we'll see what happens here. Spring practice starts on Saturday. This is a big recruiting weekend coming up, and. Uh, I gotta believe something's gonna happen here in the next 24 hours or so. You know, we'll we'll we'll, we'll see what happens there. All right, uh, later today on the website, we are gonna have uh, some basketball coverage as this crazy season uh, continues for the Miami Hurricanes, and uh, it looks like they're gonna be playing for the regular season ACC championship on Saturday somehow, some way, despite. The, the way they've blown so, a few of these games this year. Uh, they, uh, Zuby, you were at the Florida State game on Saturday. They blew a 25-point lead. Uh, I don't understand how a team can be this good and have the lapses that this team has had in some of these games this year. The loss to Georgia Tech, the loss to Florida State um, are two great examples of that. If they just take care of business in those two games against bad teams and don't find a way to lose, they are easily winning the ACC regular season championship. And uh, no doubt in my mind that they're the best team in the ACC. As they get ready to play Pitt on Saturday for the regular season title, as they get ready to go to Greensboro next week for the ACC tournament, Azubi, what's your read on this team? Yeah, so kind of going back to the Florida State game on Saturday, I just have to say I've never seen so many people go from ecstatic to what just happened in the last six, seven seconds of that game with the energies got sucked out the arena. But in that game, kind of staying on that topic, I feel like Nigel Pack was really, really needed in that game because we all know his, you know, great shooting ability. And I feel like if in that second half, you know, Miami's offense, you know, they were scoring, but there just wasn't a spark. And I feel like Nigel Pack is always that guy late in the second half we saw. You know, earlier this season, him score 17 points in five minutes. He gives Miami that spark that they needed. And that's something that Jim Leonega spoke about. He said the first half of that game was probably the first half, the best first half we played all year. But the second half, we ran out of gas. And I feel like Nigel Pack was there not saying this whole game is on him, but I feel like him coming in could have could have done a little bit of something. But this game against Pittsburgh coming up, a rematch of a game that they blew an eight-point lead in the last two minutes. So I'm hoping that doesn't happen on the home court and we see Miami, you know, cutting down those nets and celebrating their first ACC championship in uh, 10 years. I love Jim Laranega. I think he is a phenomenal coach. But what's with the kid gloves? What's with the excuse here? The, the you know, ran out of gas. They they had to play what, in, in what, a week? Yeah. Going into that game? How do you run out of gas when you've been resting for a week? Uh Coach Laranega has got to get tougher on these guys. It, 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 it's like that's unacceptable, you know, for that team to blow a 25-point lead. I thought he was a little slow on the trigger in, in calling a timeout mm -hmm. when that lead started to go away. Uh, the big Achilles heel of this team this year, Azubi, is that they go to sleep on defense. And you start seeing teams like we saw Florida State on Saturday 
making walk-in layups with nobody contesting anything. I mean, it, it, it's unfathomable. Like, they play this lockdown, unbelievable defense in the first half, so you know they're capable of doing it, and then they, they just stop giving effort, like, you know, without any warning at all, and teams start scoring way too easily. Uh, guys, I know you're up this morning. I know you're watching your favorite show. It is about to be March. Today is February 28th. Tomorrow is March. March, March, March. March Madness, ACC Tournament. You're playing for the title on Saturday. That means you got a mulligan for all your sins this season. I know you only have six losses, but in all those six of those games, other than maybe the one where Maryland bully balled you guys, uh, you could have won all five of those games. And it's your it's your lapses, it's your mental lapses um, that are separating you from winning and losing with a time of year approaching now where there is no margin for error anymore. So, um, you know, Matt, I can't move on to another subject without giving you a chance to weigh in on this. Uh, you know, your thoughts on what you've been seeing from basketball lately and what you think we will see here in the month of March. It'll be interesting because it's it's uh, if this was early in the season, this is one of those games where by the end of the season they say that was the turning point. That game we we had a team meeting, we came together, we we knew we couldn't do that again, you know. But now it's really bad time of year to have a game like that. Really bad time of year to have a full week off to have to try and say, is there something wrong with our team that we have to change? Do we just keep doing what we've been doing, even though we blew a twenty five point twenty five point lead to a bad team? There's a lot of questions to be answered. Uh, you know, full disclosure, when this game was being played, I was in La Jolla, California. Uh, I had spent some time hanging out with the Sea Lions and the Seals, for those of you who have been out there before. And I figured, what do I need to watch this game on TV for? You know, Miami's favored by two touchdowns. FSU's terrible. But, you know, I figured I should constantly, as I do as a reporter, I constantly am checking in. So I just finished a lobster roll. We were in Little Italy, downtown San Diego. I went to a dessert place, a famous dessert place over there. Uh, wasn't very good. Famous dessert places tend to not be good, I think. For some reason, maybe you think they're too good. They never are. They don't live up to your expectation. Whatever. So I look at the score, and I'm like, I don't believe this, because I had seen the halftime score, you know? <laughs> I didn't even check again until there was like a minute left, two minutes left in the game, and it was close. So I put it on my phone on my YouTube TV app, and I'm sitting in this famous, you know, bakery in the middle of San Diego, like yelling at my TV <laughs> and my phone. Like, I could not believe what I saw. And then... After the game ended, <clears throat> I got a call from a, a booster uh, friend of mine, and he was just irate. Uh, he, he, you know, we we both agreed on this point. I'm not going to say everything he said because it's not fair to Coach Larinaga. He was very upset, this guy. But what we, what we both did agree on, and I think is true, and maybe you guys will disagree, is that Jim Larinaga, as great a coach as he is, and I don't think anyone can dispute he's a great coach. He's done it year after year after year. The one thing he does and it gets in his head about is numbers and stats. And when he sees my team's up by 25 points and there's 18 minutes left, he does the math in his head and he says, if we just hold the ball for 25 seconds every possession, they and they hit even 70% of their shots, we win by two points. You know, and he's he's right. You know, the math is there. You know, all we have to do is score a few baskets. We can hit 10% of our shots. They hit 70%. We still win. I get it but you're taking the aggressiveness away from a team that is based on being aggressive. It's like telling a football team, you know, every offensive possession, we're going to take a knee and run 40 seconds off the clock because we're up by 28 points and we don't want to turn the ball over because we think our offense is terrible. You don't want the best ball players to be like, oh, you know, we just got to go one-on-one -on -one with five on the clock or 10 on the clock. That's not how basketball teams are meant to be run. To me, you know, I know you want to win games, but, you know, I've coached at a very low level children. Gary's coached at a very low level, toddlers. Uh, Azubi was a high level player and Steven does nothing with sports. So what I would say, just having coached at my very low level is for me, it was always about teaching. Yeah, you want to win every game. But to me, you never tell a team, you know, with two minutes left in the third quarter, slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. You know, that you, they go into that base, you know, run the clock offense that, that Larinaga loves to use, which costs them some games. Like, you know, they, they could be up by eight points in some games with two minutes left. Everyone remembers these games. It's not just one of them. They go into this slow plotting offense, which a lot of, a lot of programs do the same thing. But a lot of other programs have a big man 
in the center, and you get in the ball with 10 seconds on the clock, and he goes to work inside, and he kicks it out to an open guy for an easy shot. That's not this team. Like, Coach Taranega, I think, doesn't realize he, – he, he should have seen it earlier in the year because we all – everyone else did. This isn't a team that does well – when you tell them, okay, get it down under 10 seconds, the shot clock, and then take a shot. Like, that's not this team. This team doesn't have a big guy to get an easy shot inside. You know, and, and if the three-pointers aren't falling and the other team starts hitting some shots, now all of a sudden things are crumbling. And we saw a massive, massive Rome is falling moment for Miami. Uh, you know, I know Jim Larning won't, won't do anything different next time either. He would do the same thing all over again because he's already shown that this is how he coaches. This is what he believes in. And you know what? Kudos to him for that. But as a as a fan, you know, as a child coach, I don't I don't like it that much. Well, when I was coaching these toddlers that you speak of, <laughs> I know I, I know one thing. Okay, if I have a twenty five point lead and the other team starts making walk in layups and my guys aren't playing defense, I'm calling timeout immediately. Like I don't even let that noise get started. So you know, I think that's something Jim Laranega has got to look at as they go into the postseason. Mental lapses, his team falling See, asleep you, mentally. You still don't understand what I said. The mental lapses came because he was telling them to, to hold the ball. That you but I'm, fall I'm asleep. not talking about offense. It's I'm like talking about defense. Offense right? and defense feed each other, Gary. They feed each okay. other. It's like watching a bad okay. movie. The first five minutes, you know, you could sit through it and they start falling asleep. The team fell asleep because Laranega on offense told them to fall asleep. You can't tell someone to fall asleep on offense and then wake up, wake up, and get back on the air. Fair point. A uh, fair point. But, you know, this has been the Achilles heel of this team. And um, Norchad Omier is a, is a big – what the hell is going on? Steven, what's up, man? What's going on with the glasses? <laughs> you all right? I'm can, experimenting here. Can you see me? How many fingers am I holding up? <laughs> I've hey, got Steven, three, Gary. Steven, people uh, want to buy tickets for our big fight. When are we going to have our big fight? That's what I'm trying to figure out, too. we got to put something on the schedule. Yeah. I'm sitting here trying to concentrate, and I see Steven, like, doing this. <laughs> like, what the heck, man? Uh, but trying to get back on the train of thought here. By the way, Steven, you're, I, I checked the Vegas odds. You're favored by three teeth. <laughs> no kidding. Wow. No, yeah, yeah, you're, I, minus, you're, minus, you're minus three. I need well, to put I'm, some I'm, I guess I'm minus three teeth. You're plus three. I guess it's different when it's teeth, not points. I'm, plus, <laughs> I'm minus three teeth. You're plus three teeth. I need to put some money down on that. You're taking the over or the under? Over. Way over. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, anyway, so, you know, there's times you see Norchad fall asleep out there. Uh, you're going to start playing games where you you can't, you know, these games might be decided by two points, three points. You can't throw possessions away by being lazy on defense. I hope Coach Laranega can get these guys focused in for the postseason. If he can, I think this is a team that can go very deep in March Madness. But – you know, there's no more mulligans, man. It's over. Uh, we're we're down to you lose, you snooze, you lose. And uh, that could mean blowing the regular season championship when they clearly are the best team in the conference right now. It could mean blowing the ACC tournament next week where they're going to get a double bye and only have to win a couple games to win that. Uh, and then, of course, single elimination, the NCAA tournament. And uh, they're playing for seeding right now. I think that those losses are going to cost them a couple of seating positions uh, fairly, as they should. Uh, so probably looking at what, Azubi, what do you think, like a 4-5 or five seed maybe? Yeah, that's what I'm thinking about, a 4-5 or five seed. If that Georgia Tech and Florida State loss doesn't happen, I'm thinking easily a 2 or 3 seed. But those yeah. two losses versus teams with sub-500 records and by a lot, too, is kind of like head scratching a little bit. You don't see too many top 10 teams, top 15 teams losing those type of matchups, especially – by a 25-point margin with 18 minutes to go in that second half. So my guess, unless they run the table in the um, ACC tournament, I'm, I'm looking at a four, four or five seed. All right, something I want to touch on re real quick here is um, Matt takes a shot at predicting the biggest uh, surprise offensive player and defensive player uh, coming up this spring. Matt, you pick Isaiah Horton, the wide young wide receiver, as your surprise offensive player. Uh, tell us why. Where'd you come up with that? I don't. I don't know that anybody else in the universe. If you said to them who is going to be the surprise on offense for the Miami Hurricanes in spring practice, it would be a redshirt freshman wide receiver who doesn't even have a coach right now, and he's going to be the surprise of spring. How'd you come up with that one? Yeah. So I put. You know, I picked ten different players I thought could be surprises. 
Uh, I put their names in a hat and I picked one out and it was Isaiah Horton. <laughs> no, so listen, I mean, you know, I, we, we all talk to people around the program and they, they, there are people at Miami that are excited at about, about Isaiah Horton. Um, they said, you know, as long as there's no wide receivers coach to tell him what to do, he's amazing. Like he, as long as he's left to his own devices, nobody tells him anything about technique or how to run a route. As long as there's no wide receivers coach, everything's great, Gary, right? That's what you like? You said it's fine. There's no receivers coach. Uh, I don't think it's fine. I think it's not ideal. I'm not worried about it. Right no guy. concerns. No worries. It's okay. It's not ideal. Hey, you could hire some hire somebody in five seconds if they can't recruit. It's a wasted hire. I mean, when you talk about the receivers coach, it sounds like you're talking about your, you know you got your last haircut. It's okay. It's not that ideal. Is, my, Miami can't be Miami again if they don't start getting these elite receivers. Well, anyway, look. Somebody told me Isaiah Horton's been doing really well. Uh, the reason I think he's a no-brainer as a potential surprise is because there's very little outside receiver proven talent, whereas I think there's a lot of slot guys, including a couple of true freshmen that are coming in, that either are blazing fast or, you know, you got Xavier or Shepard, Burchard Smith, who at least have done some things that you've flashed. You know, Colby Young and Frank Latson got so many opportunities last year, and I wouldn't say they were trailblazers of any kind, other than Colby Young having a couple of 100-yard games in a row and then disappearing. So a guy like Isaiah Horton, especially the new receivers coach coming in and new offense coordinator, he's going to have every chance with that frame, that leaping ability, good enough speed uh, to be a playmaker in this offense. There's the, in year two, there's a big, big jump between year one and year two. A lot of coaches aren't going to trust a year one wide receiver outside boundary receiver. There's not, you know, because if that guy winds up one on one with a cornerback and the quarterback takes a chance like they're supposed to and throws the ball up to him and that freshman wide receiver doesn't really know what he's doing. That could be a game-changing play. Uh, so, so I think in year two, hopefully, Isaiah you know, can show coaches they can trust him. If he shows coaches that they can trust him, he has all the skills in the world to do what he needs to do, and he can be an outstanding football player this year. All right. Defense, I got a bone to pick with you, though, because you hedged. Like, you're supposed to be picking one guy, and you decide that you can't make up your mind, so you decide to write that Chris Graves and Chase Smith are going to be – the surprise defensive players this spring. Matt, why couldn't you just pick one of them? It's like trying to decide if Stephen Wagner or Zuby Charles is a better cane sport representative. It's impossible to say. They're both outstanding. Now now will you now will you take the under on the three teeth, Stephen? I said something <laughs> no, nice. I said something nice about you. How about two teeth? The line down two teeth. Only one tooth. <laughs> Look, the problem on defense is it's not as obvious a situation to me on the offense it was obvious you know that we're not talking about true freshmen they're not going to be a surprise because they're true freshmen you know by nature if any true freshman does well it's a surprise it's like silly to name a true freshman like that's a true freshman who's going to be great no it, we're talking about returning players that'll surprise because they already had a chance they didn't surprise now they can surprise so on defense there's not a whole lot of those type of guys that i think um, can do it, can do that because you know, Wesley Bissane's you're not going to pick him because he already showed what he can do. Nigel Kelly, same thing. Uh, Miami on defense last year used such a heavy rotation under Coach Steele, which you know, Gary, you and I didn't love. You know, I don't know if Azubi talked about it that much. We didn't love the heavy rotation, but because of the heavy rotation, so many of these guys on defense played and got a chance, um, to sort of show what they're all about. And it was sort of hard to say, okay, you know, this guy is he really going to make that big a jump up without just making something up? Now, with that said, you know, Chris Graves, I've heard really good things about. He was injured last year. He was supposed to be in the rotation at cornerback. And the other cornerbacks were really not good behind, uh, honestly, Tyreek Stevenson. And DJ Ivey was better than some people said he was, you know, or thought he would be. He was okay. Uh, and to Corey Couch is obviously nickel. So Chris, Chris Graves, um, I think, can, be, can push to start at corner over a couple of transfers. Uh, now, Chase Smith's a guy who I thought was in line for an amazing year. Coaches I know were super excited about him heading into last year. He totally reshaped his body. He came in as a true freshman. I mean, Stephen maybe could have taken out one of his teeth, not two. Uh, now, I think Chase would take out all of Stephen's teeth. Like, Chase has, has uh, I, I, can't, I can't tell you for sure how much weight he's gained, but he looks like he's put on at least 20 pounds of muscle. When, you look, when I saw him before last season versus just a year earlier, it was like the Zion Nelson transformation. I was like, wait a minute. That's Chase Smith's face on some other body. Like it was one of those weird, um, you know, pixelation moments, like where you, you know, you're just like, did somebody Photoshop his body onto him in real life? Because that's what it looked like. And so I'm super excited for him. If he can stay healthy, he has just this history of injuries, which is, which is disconcerting. 
And you know, on the offensive side, by the way, they, you know, I could have done the same thing and just and just gone with two guys. I didn't want to, and that's why Don Chaney wasn't one of them. Uh, on defense, I felt it wasn't fair to either of these guys to just pick one of them. Uh, so, Gary, you can criticize me all you want, but I could not, in my heart of hearts, pick one of these guys over the other because both of them, I think, can be major surprises. It's so wrong to say there can be two surprises at the same time. It doesn't have to be one. Who says one? I mean, you're going to eat only one giant cookie. If you can eat two, you eat two. I can eat two giant cookies. You can eat one. So I get two picks as the defensive surprise player of the year. I'm going to go Chase Smith of those two. Uh, you know, it's time for him. Uh, it's ne- it's really now or never. He's got a he's got a lot of ability, and uh, they thought last year was going to be the year he broke out. Uh, I'm going to say Chase Smith for the surprise player on defense of spring. All right, a ton of recruiting stuff on the website for you guys today. Uh, Steven's been locking himself in a closet and doing a lot of film study. Uh, Ryan Wingo, we talked about earlier. You've also got a film breakdown on Decisive Raider. We earlier had a, a Jeremiah Smith breakdown. Uh, speaking of Jeremiah Smith, he was promoted to a five-star prospect in the new 2024 on 300 and on three industry ranking that we talked about earlier. Uh, so check that out. Jeremiah Smith uh, now moving up the charts. Uh, we also take a look on where Miami's priority recruits rank in those rankings. Uh, so you can uh, get a snapshot look at that. Um, you know, what else, Stephen? Am I leaving out anything? Um, you know, for today, I, I mean, there, um, we've got, I know we, we've we got, uh, let's see, a, a story on a uh, 2025 uh, good-looking uh four-star prospect that everybody can start getting to know. Um, Probably about it, right, Stephen? Yeah, I think that's about it. Dalen Singleton, uh, just real quick, and I will actually make this quick. Uh, Dalen Singleton, 2025 four-star prospect out of DeSoto, Texas. Uh, He sat behind uh, Jonte Cook, who I think was an on-three consensus five-star last year. You might want to double-check me on that. Uh, but uh, he was a really talented receiver who ended up signing with Texas. Uh, and uh, Dalen Singleton, you know, he's kind of been built up as this kid where, you know, he's just waiting for his moment to step into the spotlight. And it seems like this is going to be that moment. Uh, Miami's really high on him. They like him quite a bit. Uh, and uh, he's going to be coming down to campus uh, this weekend for, uh, for, for an unofficial visit. Hey, Stephen, I'm looking over your uh, left shoulder there. You've got a thermostat. No, you got a thermostat up there on the wall. I do have a thermostat hey, on the wall. It's a great you're wearing a sweatshirt. Yeah. Okay. Like in your in your place of living, you're wearing a sweatshirt and you're sitting next to a thermostat. Okay. Yeah. All right. Here's what you do. All you gotta do is change the temperature, man. You know it, that. You know it looks like that's digital. Just hit the down. Just hit the down button a few times. <laughs> then how am I supposed to represent the brand? <laughs> how am I supposed to represent the brand if I'm hot, Gary? <laughs> All right. Well, enjoy the electric bill. Uh, <laughs> it's whatever, whatever, man. We pay you so much money. You can, you can, you can afford to give a nice chunk of it to Florida Power and Light every month. No problem. All right. Hey, guys, it was great to be back today with you. With you. I missed you all last week. Azubi, thank I'm you so much. Thank you so much for carrying the uh, the 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 the, the uh, like, what the throne? What's the what's Matt? What's the word I'm looking for? Carrying the what? My mind. The, the torch. Carrying the torch. All right. Yeah. Azubi, awesome job. Seriously, carrying the torch while I was gone. We'll uh, we'll have to do that more often because uh, uh, I hate waking up this damn early. Uh, <laughs> you know, Matt Matt, Matt 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 wakes up like this every single day. Um, man, so sometimes I like to sleep in a little bit, uh, and I know you guys do too, but we'll figure it all out. Um, thank you guys out there so much for starting out your day with us. If you like the show, like our YouTube channel, hit your like button, hit your subscribe button, helps us with the algorithms that YouTube grow our audience. Uh, spring practice starts Saturday. We're going to blow it out of the park for you guys with coverage. Uh, if you're not yet a canesport.com subscriber, uh, please hustle on over to our website, canesport.com. Uh, join our community of fans and subscribe to our service. We still have an introductory special in force that will take you to the start of football season. We would love to have you at canesport.com. So for Zuby Charles, Stephen Wagner, 
Matt Shodell, I'm Gary Furman. Thanks again, everybody. We'll see you next time.